Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. I wasn't totally sure that these accusations of voter suppression were 100% legitimate. So I went in with an open mind, but after speaking with and interviewing the 11 people that are featured in the film, I, you know, I feel like that's kind of the journey of the film. This is my life. Like I, I don't have like a big personal life outside of working on these projects and making films like this is really, I live you know, for my family and then to be able to make films. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 13, and it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, The Documentary Life Podcast, and The Documentary Academy, our industry-changing A to Z documentary filmmaking program that will transform you into the documentary filmmaker that you've always wanted to be. Find out more at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. This episode is another segment of our monthly conversations with a documentary industry person. For this month's installment, I spoke with documentary filmmaker and record label owner Brian Jenkins, who is based out of San Diego, California, and who has just this past week released his film Answering the Call, a film that takes a personal approach to exploring the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that was put in place not long after the major protests that occurred in Selma, Alabama during the critical civil rights period of American history. It's a very good and timely film done by an extraordinary individual who has clear and defined DIY roots that go back to when he was a teenager making rock and roll in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Let's listen in on that conversation that I had with Brian Jenkins. Brian, thank you for joining us today on The Documentary Life I think the first thing that I would begin saying is that you are someone who reached out to me a few weeks ago with the release of your film, which is coming up. And and, and we'll get into that in a bit. Of course, the timing with your film answering the call is impeccable in terms of both for this podcast as well as the, the upcoming elections. Let me ask you, Brian, how you first came to know about the documentary life, the, the show. So I, I actually found out about the podcast through Faith at Desktop documentaries, I saw that she had posted her episode. So I, I gave that a listen. And then I, I pretty quickly went through and listened to everything prior to that. And so yeah, I'm coming at this as, as a fan of the podcast. That's excellent. I'd love to hear that. For anyone who missed our last industry guest episode, we had Faith Fuller on, a filmmaker in her own right with the film Briars and the Cotton Patch, and of course, the curator and founder of of desktop documentaries, an online resource for documentary filmmakers. Let me ask you then, Brian, along those lines, how has desktop documentaries helped you with your own documentary life and your own documentary endeavors? Well, I mean, this this was my second documentary that I've completed. So I told Faith, because she, you know, she markets it, you know, as a as a first time documentary filmmaker. And I'm like, man, I, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't, I wouldn't cons consider myself an old pro, but right. I, you know, I, I think there's a lot of good stuff out there for for every, you know, I, I'm filmmakers on every scale of the spectrum. So, um, no, I just, I think the the main thing that I kind of went to that site for was just distribution uh, tips. And I learned a lot uh, about some of the educational distribution markets that I hadn't tapped into previously that I think are going to really, really help my film out this go around. Well, and, and, and were you taking advantage of sort of like her, her online educational resources or was it more the networking through the message boards? What exactly was it that, that has worked for you and how did you do it? I think what I, um, I, what really helped me was some of the guest posts she'll have. Um, I don't recall the, the woman's name who, who writes about the educational licensing, but mm. that's, I think how I came, came to the site. And then, 
you know, I think even, you know, getting ready to start my third film, I would, I would probably highly consider checking out some of her courses. I think there's always something new to learn and something new to pick up for the next project. So, you know, I have a lot of, you know, friends and contacts that have been doing this longer than me that, you know, when I get talking to them, I realize that, <laughs> wow, I, I think I might know more about this end of distribution than you do. And I think it's mm. important just with how quick things are changing. And if, if you want to keep doing films and, and, you know, supplement, hopefully, I guess the goal is always to, to make your income off of making films. I know right. you've talked about that in the past, but it's, you know, you got to stay on top of this stuff because there's, it seems like every year there, you know, every month there's something new or <laughs> a new opportunity out there. So I think it's really important, you know, no matter where you're at, if, if you are kind of looking to kind of self-distribute and as the filmmaker control, you know, a lot of the rights to your film, it's important to, to stay educated and, and keep up. Brian, what I'd love to do is rewind a little bit because something that really interested me when you reached out to me and emailed me and I looked up who Brian Jenkins was um, initially as a filmmaker and then I would find out some of your background and your background comes from music and it comes from playing and producing music and then of course with your record label Riot House Records. Why don't you tell my listeners and maybe it's maybe it's a little bit just because I kind of geek out on this stuff and I want to hear about it. <laughs> but I would love to hear about how Riot House Records, the label, started. Yeah, so I, I grew up in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I guess like my first and en- like entry into the creative field was through music. So right. I started out um, as a guitar player, playing in bands um, throughout high school, into college, afterwards, and. I guess I'd say the thing that really kicked it off was uh, my wife and I had a band called Black Jet Radio that we right. did toured for about a year, did, um, you know, a couple like we did one three month run of almost uh, 90 stops. And oh, wow. after doing that, I realized, you know, that through that experience, um, you know, I really launched the record label afterwards. Uh, we had actually taken on tour our two year old son with us, which was an incredible experience. Yeah. So I got into filmmaking through just through the record label, through doing music videos, um, doing some live music stuff. And actually one of the first, uh, videos I produced was for a band called empty mansions, which was, uh, the drummer from Interpol, Sam Fogarino. Yeah. I was listening to them this morning, actually. Okay. Yeah. Members of Jesus lizard. Yeah. And so I, uh, that, that was my first music first music video I ever did and it, it uh, premiered on Rolling Stone. So it was a pretty, a pretty high moment for the, uh, for the first kind of real professional thing I'd done. Yeah. That's exciting. And I was, you know, I was really hooked from there and, you know, over the next couple of years, I, you know, released a lot of music through Riot House Records, but my, uh, I guess my heart, my passion sort of started to shift focuses and uh, wanting to get kind of more into film. So um, last year or in 2015, I got involved with a documentary here in San Diego called Records Collecting Dust, right. which was being directed by a, a local filmmaker, Jason Blackmore. And that film featured interviews with people like Jello Biafra from uh, The Dead Kennedys, mm-hmm. uh, Keith Morris from Black Flag, Chuck Dukowski from Black Flag, Mike Watt from The Minutemen. And it was a film about how people got into, or I guess, I guess how the, the vinyl format shaped these guys' lives and artist, artistic direction. Totally. So I came on to that film as a producer, and then I also uh, had the distribution rights. So that was kind of my first step into feature documentary filmmaking. And, you know, from that experience, I was, I was hooked. And how did, you, how did you sort of acquire the distribution rights? Why was that something that was attractive to you? Well... It's it's kind of funny how I think film and music distribution they kind of go hand in hand. There's obviously a lot of similarities. So I uh, I kind of approached that at first as just from the business standpoint, like I'd be interested in distrib- distributing this, doing the marketing, doing the PR, and then I got more involved with the creative side. But you know, I'd had um, through my record label. You know, we have a wholesale distributor. We have a, uh, we're distributed through the Orchard digitally. So I'd had a lot of experience with you know creating something putting it out and then making sure it gets in front of as many people as possible. So that's a lot of my background comes from the distribution side of music. And then it was pretty, pretty simple segue into film. Moving from uh, records collecting dust to answering the call. At what point did you know that you wanted to do your own documentary film and how and why this particular subject matter? And then please use that to tee up what answering the call is all about. So this is something that's, really 
the answering the call has been in kind of in the back of my mind, I'd say since even high school, mm -hmm. um, just wanting to do this story. And so I guess I'll start at the beginning. Um, so I grew up hearing about uh, my uncle, John Wittick, his stories of Selma, Alabama. And in 1965, he was a student at the University of Virginia when he saw uh, what would be what would be later termed as a bloody Sunday. He saw the live footage of protesters in Selma being viciously beaten and attacked by Alabama state troopers. Right. So that night he's in his dorm room uh, feeling distressed after seeing this. And he hears Dr. Martin Luther King on the radio call for support. Basically the message that if you're seeing this and if you're outraged, please come to Selma and join us in a second march. And so that night he gathered up a group of friends and uh, two clergymen from the UVA campus. And they, dra they traveled through the night to Selma and arrived on what is known as Turnaround Tuesday today, which hmm. was a second march attempt that had been stopped at, at the bridge once again. So I, um, I guess like from the personal standpoint, like my uncle is my hero. He's dedicated his life to social justice work. He's, you know, worked with union labors. Uh, he's worked with, um, solidarity projects in Hawaii, uh, worked to protect land for indigenous people in Hawaii. So he was just somebody that I always looked up to. And, you know, every, every step of the way in my life, I, I always found myself asking, you know, when I had an opportunity, would, what would my uncle do here? And oh, amazing. so I, I really, I really started out the idea to do this film as maybe just a short film to document his story of Selma. Because, you know, I was fascinated that, you know, I knew somebody or I'm related to somebody that was there at such a major piece of American history. And I thought it'd be interesting to tell his story and kind of give give his perspective from sort of a spectator, just a participant. You know, we know we know about the civil rights movement through the lens of Dr. King, through the lens of Lyndon B. Johnson. But, you know, a lot of history for those who took part and maybe aren't, you know, famous politicians or or figureheads, you know, their stories, you know, potentially go at one point lost. So I really wanted to honor my uncle by documenting his story. You know, as I as I got into pre-production and researching this topic, I realized, you know, I wasn't aware of how closely connected Selma was to voting rights mm -hmm. in that voting rights, you know, are still under attack to this day. I think a lot of my education growing up in the Midwest taught me that, you know, Dr. King and the civil rights movement had cured America of racism. <laughs> and today, and I think a lot of people have that, that that's why so many, you know, white Americans have so much trouble understanding these issues today, because I think, I think we're indoctrinated into that belief. And so I, I, I realized that this, this story in this film was, you know, a perfect opportunity to tell my uncle's story, but then also use it to explore the state of voter suppression today in America. And that's really, sorry, was that too long winded? No, it's great. I love <laughs> right. it. I love it. And it's it's great because how you described it really is kind of how the film is laid out. Because there's the, there's the context in the beginning, you know, where where we see what had happened during that time, you know, on the bridge and what was happening in Selma, and then your uncle is brought into the film, and then from there, really, that's how you get into. You know, this idea of, of the well, you get into the Voter, Voters Rights Act and what has happened since it was in place, you know, 40, 50 years ago and, and where it's at now. And in fact, as you can you can describe or, or maybe you can let your film describe in the past year alone, more and more rights are being stripped. More of that Voters uh, Rights Act is really being taken away across the board in many states across the across the country. And of course, with you know our our election that is you know weeks away at this point, it's even more appropriate. In particular, your film in dealing with vo the you know the Voters Rights Act. You know that what really kind of bothered me and what really drove me was that I feel like in America we you know we hold up Dr. King, we hold up the Civil Rights Movement, we hold up people like Congressman John Lewis as heroes, and we honor them pretty much across the board with with you know majority support for that movement, but then. I don't I, I have trouble with that because we don't honor we don't I guess we dishonor that movement when we allow like the Voting Rights Act to be struck down by the Supreme Court and we elect leaders who refuse to update it so that it can be put back into law. And right. that was something that I really, you know, wanted to draw that connection was that okay, if we're gonna really, you know, honor these people, then the way to do that is to continue progressing with legislation and protecting legislation that came about. But, you know, the, the Voting Rights Act, you know, second to probably the Civil Rights Act is one of the most important pieces of civil rights legislation. And I don't think I think most Americans don't realize that it's basically uh, been crippled and, and is almost useless at this point, And it has been since 2013. 
it's well put, and I think you're right in saying that most of us aren't even aware that that's happened. And unfortunately, a lot of things like that happen, and most of us aren't necessarily aware that that it's happening. Um, I, you know, very recently, you know, you have what's happening in the Midwest in North Dakota with the uh, the pipeline access that's happening up there and the Native Americans who are gathering up north and that are protesting this. And the story is not being heard. And in fact, it's being silenced in some ways by things like the arrest of documentary filmmaker Dia Schlossberg, as well as other documentary filmmakers who are being being arrested. And a lot of that's kind of going under the radar. And so this idea of, of freedom of the press, you know, we think that it's it's just an assumed thing in this country because we're a democratic nation. But things like this are being stripped away all the time. And your film and your message is yet another example of that with the Voters' Rights Act. And I don't know. I, I don't know what the answer is. I know that it's you're doing important work. Documentary filmmakers are doing important work. Journalists are doing the important work. But it's almost as if in this day and age, sometimes I wonder that there's, I worry that there's information overload because there are so many things that are happening that are undermining our rights that a lot of people are unaware of. And oh, definitely. I don't, I don't know what the answer is because, we, yeah. We please. talked a lot about that in Selma, my, my uncle and I, and, you know, it's almost, you know, Facebook's a great tool in that you can get the message out, but I think it's almost caused people to maybe sit back and be a little bit more passive. Mm. And I've had to look at myself with this, you know, you know, just sharing a video that makes you outraged isn't really activism, isn't really, you know, taking a stand and, and trying to work towards progress. And I think um, it's caused, you know, it, it, it allows you to have a million causes that you care about. But I think the only unfortunate side to that is that, you know, with like with the pipeline, that's going to be gone in three months, probably less. And <laughs> we'll be asking, you know, next year, I wonder whatever happened with that. And yeah, right. so, but at the, the, at the other side, on the other side of this, um, you know, this is something that I expected, you know, speaking with the people in my film, you know, I was, I was wondering if a lot of these people that are in their seventies that were around in 1965 and worked so hard to pass the voting rights act, mm. if at this, you know, 50 years later, seeing that we've sort of regressed in a way, you know, how would they respond? How would they feel? And I was amazed that there was an, a, a unanimous, you know, no progress has been made, but progress is slow. And, and it, you know, it requires, you know, it's a lot, oftentimes it's three steps forward, four steps back, two steps forward. And so I don't know, I felt a lot of, um, inspiration from that. Cause I was feeling, and I have no right to feel this, you know, I'm 30 years old, a white man in America. Right. I'm not as emotionally connected to this, but I was feeling very disgusted and, uh, pessimistic and wondering if anything's any better, you know, 50 years later, or if, you know, things are worse in a lot of different ways. And I don't know, that was really inspiring for me to speak with everyone I spoke to in the film to sort of kind of negate those thoughts for me and realize that there are people that are that are working 24 seven on these issues. And I think, you know, I just would maybe remind anybody listening that if you do care about something, it's really simple to just write your congressman or call the office, you know, if, if you're bothered about this pipeline, you know, nobody's nobody's checking fa your Facebook status. Like you, you have to take action and you, you can do it in really small ways. And that's something that this film working on answering the call has reminded me of, because I was amazed to speak with um, one of the people I interviewed was uh, the senior legislative uh, councilwoman for the ACLU. Uh, her name is Deborah J. Vagans. Right. And she worked for a number of years as the lobbyist directly with George W. Bush and reauthorizing the Voting Rights Act. Mm. And she said that she was amazed how many um, congressmen who stood in the way of, of fixing the Voting Rights Act after the Supreme Court ruling said that I'm not hearing from my constituents on this. Nobody's emailing me about the Voting Rights Act. Oh, you know, wow. you guys are. And I think there's some truth to that, that, you know, there are a lot of people upset about it, but it's not enough to just tweet it. It's not enough to just share it on Facebook. There's other things you need to do. So. Somebody that makes a film like yourself, like answering the call, there's a so there's a social cause that's attached to this. I'm curious, what do you think the documentary filmmaker's responsibility is when they they feel passionately about a subject or a social cause enough to make a film about it, but do they have a responsibility afterwards to follow that up? Yeah, I'm glad you asked this because I think, you know, I imagine there's 
I know there's a, a number of schools of thought on this. And, you know, I've read, you know, very established documentary filmmakers who say you should never even go into the film with a cause. And then mm. there's others that say, so I don't think there's a wrong or right way going in. And I think as an audience member, you can decide if, if, you know, a film that maybe has a message or has, you know, is, is, is maybe a little bit biased. If you don't want to watch that, that's okay. But yeah. for me, I'm really, um, excited about, and I want to watch films that are personal and, and do take a stand. And I, I, I side on, you know, feeling that like, things that are just too straight down the middle or kind of bore me. And <laughs> as long as I think you're responsible and how you represent the information, I don't think there's anything wrong with investigative journalism taking a stand as long as you have facts to support it and interviews to support it. So I guess going to after the film, um, you know, that's a, that's a difficult question. I think that I think it's hard as a filmmaker because, you know, I see a lot of filmmakers that will spend like four or five years still promoting their film afterwards. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's that's tough because, you know, you want to keep making films and, you know, if the goal is to, you know, to to do this for a living, you have to keep moving forward. But I think that would really just come down to the filmmaker. I mean, I think for me, I would I feel passionate about still staying involved with, you know, reauthorizing the Voting Rights Act. I feel that after working on this film and it's not something I felt going in, I didn't really feel that voting was as important as it as I do today. Mm. But I think that we can't institute really any real change or move progress until the Voting Rights Act is restored. Because right now, without the Voting Rights Act in place, we're, I don't feel that we're having a fair uh, representation in democracy. I mean, there's, you know, it's it, right now it's basically perfectly legal for states to pass discriminatory laws that wouldn't have been possible with the Voting Rights Act. So I'd say for me, I can I plan to continue my activism uh, for restoring the Voting Rights Act, but I don't necessarily think that that's an obligation for a filmmaker. I grew up hearing the stories of my uncle's experience in Selma in the days after Bloody Sunday. His involvement in social justice has always had a profound effect on me, and together we traveled back to Selma to retrace his steps 51 years later. But we also found that the fight for voting rights is far from over. This is our journey. Your choice to make this film be narrated by your own personal journey with the subject matter, and in particular with your uncle and his journey, how did you come to that? Well, I think that's that's just the way I kind of envisioned it. I like personal documentaries and but I like I said I know that there's, you know, there's a school of thought that says that you should not put yourself in the film. Right. <laughs> but for me, I felt like that was that was a lot of the film was coming at it from I felt like I'm very I'm an ordinary person. There's nothing extraordinary about me and you know, this started out as a as a personal family story and then I just kind of wanted to show it through the lens of going to Selma with my uncle, retracing his steps, telling his story, and then just really seeing where the story would take us because I didn't go in with such strong feelings. I wasn't totally sure that these accusations of voter suppression were 100% legitimate. So I went in with an open mind. But after speaking with and interviewing the 11 people that are featured in the film, mm. I, you know, I feel like that's kind of the journey of the film. I thought it was a great choice on, on your part uh, to include to really, you know, to put yourself in the film and make you a part, make your personal journey a part of that film. I struggled as a filmmaker with with my Nepal doc, Journey to Kathmandu. I mean, I struggled for three, almost four years to put my own voice in it, whether whether it was na uh, narration or or literally putting me in the film. And I got to a point because I've always generally been of the school of thought, never insert yourself into the film. It's just sort of the school of doc filmmaking that I'm for the most part drawn to and what I like to make. And at, at some point I had enough people saying to me, look, you need to put yourself in the film. This is every bit your part of your journey. And I'll be honest, Brian, again, I did a number of cuts through the course of three years. And then once I finally gave into that and opened myself up to it, I realized that people were right. It was the right choice. I, I wish I hadn't been banging my head against the wall for so long and resisting that because it was the right choice. And I'll tell you, it made it made the film move in a way and flow in a way, I should say, than it hadn't before. So I can appreciate the choice to do that, especially from from coming from a place of I generally 
don't like the personal journeys when I watch documentary films. Yeah. And I, I think I'm more open to that now. <laughs> well, I think that's that's the really great thing about, you know, making films and publishing your work is you don't think these are these are tough decisions. Mm. And I don't know, it, you know, having like, you know, put out records, you know, published, you know, documentaries. I, I have a great respect for everybody mm. that has started one, finished one and then published it because absolutely no matter what you do, somebody is going to hate it. And you have to reckon with that and you have to, you have to ask yourself, you know, I think there's two ways to look at it. One, you know, what makes sense for the film and what makes sense for, you know, distributing the film and, and generating the, the largest audience. And two, you know, what do I, you know, this is, I'm, I'm going to be working on this for two, three, five, ten 10 years. That's right. So what do I want to see? And you know what? Everybody else can pass whatever judgment, but I think that that's the that's one of the things that really draws me to this is that you have to you have to make decisions you have to go with your gut and people some people are going to hate it some people are going to love it and I think that at the end of the day though you just you you go with what you think is right for the film and and I don't you know I don't really come at filmmaking from a like a classical you know filmmaker background like I'm very much I would consider myself an artist and so that's kind of what I want to reflect in my films going forward is you know, I don't, I don't see myself, you know, the, the next doc, you know, next Academy Award winning documentary filmmaker. So, you know, I, I don't see myself being the next Ken Burns and, if, right. you know, or if, if that, if something like that happens, great, but I guess I want to make the films that, that I like. And I don't know, I'd read an article too, at the time, um, a list that Michael Moore had put together, the 10 things that you need to ask yourself when making a documentary film. <laughs> know. And, you know, obviously Michael Moore is very polarizing, I think. Politically, you either hate him or love him, or yeah. from a filmmaking standpoint, you hate him or love him. But I remember there were a couple things that stood out to me, and one was make the film personal, like and and that and then his his advice was that that reaches the wide the widest audience. Oh yeah. Uh, two, you know, insert humor. He think you know that that a lot of documentary films today are so serious, a little pretentious that you know what happened to what happened to to our sense of humor, and then. I guess those were the two things that I really kind of gravitated towards. And like I said, and you employed them you, in the film pretty well. I think that I think they're both elements are definitely there. So something else that I wanted to, to point out about the film is some of your as you know, sort of some of your aesthetic choices. And now that I hear that you're, you know, 30 years old, maybe I'm completely off base now, but when it's interesting, what I felt watching this was it somehow had a decidedly, MTV 90s kind of feel to it. And what I mean by that was back in the early 90s, in particular when Clinton was running for election, there was there were a number there were a number of spots and a, lump, a number of public service announcements and their MTV news coverage um, was done and shot in a sort of way that was I, th I feel like if somebody that watches your film, they might see some of the similarities and some of it's in pacing, some of it's in the way it's edited, some of it's in, um, it, it's, it's, it's also kind of a rock and roll movie, your movie. And it's, and it's obvious that you have a passion for music and in particular, the type of music that you're using in it, I think it speaks to some of your punk rock sensibilities. And I think it speaks to obviously some of your background. You know, I, I also remember back in the early 90s when MTV was kind of covering the the upcoming election, uh, there was a, I felt that I definitely felt a move to vote and they were trying to get people out to vote in a way that I don't really see done now, certainly not by MTV. And there's something I felt in watching your film that moved me on a level in the way that dare I say MTV did <laughs> no, I, <laughs> in the I early 90s. I, I, it, I appreciate you picking up on that because I think that's definitely an influence and something that I didn't shy away from. Um, mm. You know, I, you know, I, I showed, you know, rough cuts to different people. And, you know, one of the critiques some people gave was, oh, I would, you know, the music, you know, I'd like to see it go in this direction. Mm. And I think that comes down to, you know, I, I think I definitely don't shy away from the fact that I inserted my personality and tastes into this. And totally, I think I, you know, I was really targeting a younger audience, you know, people, you know, 30 and under. And yep. I, I still think, I still think, um, you know, I still, I've still gotten, you know, great feedback from people outside that demographic too. So, but, um, I think for me, like doing a project, I never want to try going the safe route. I want to yeah. do it. I don't, I didn't have any ambition for this to be screened on PBS. It's not a PBS documentary. Mm. 
And yeah, I definitely, you know, with like that, that nineties television, like the claymation and the animation yeah, and the dynamics and, and there's meta filmmaking in it, right? We see you guys plenty of times in camera. Yeah. And I love that stuff. So yeah, it's great. Yeah. I wanted, you know, I don't like shy away from even having, you know, having that feel of, you know, a reality TV cut, even just right, just kind of moving right. quick, and and so I really wanted to. My my goal going in was to have uh, the audience feel like they were there and kind of going on the journey, and not feel like it was such a talking head sort of stuffy intellectual film. But I yep, think I yep. hope that we did, and I think we did, you know, hit some of those intellectual points and and present it in a way that I think that you know, from the feedback thus far, people that dedicate their life to this have really appreciated the film. And then people that don't know anything about the Voting Rights Act have walked away learning something and feeling entertained and excited. We noticed as we walked to the white community, the black community had no sidewalks, had no curbs, had no lighting. You could tell the boundary because the white community had all that curb, sidewalks, and, and street lights. We noticed a, a garage across the street, a white garage auto repair place and there were a couple of white guys there and they're waving you know come over and so my friend and I decided to cross the street we went over there and the two guys who had waved to us suddenly grabbed us <laughs> and pulled us inside the garage and in the garage there were about 20 white men they shouted at us as we were pulled to the back of the garage. Nigger lover! Traitor! And we were hauled up front and they, they demanded, Why'd you come to Selma? Why are you making trouble here? Why don't you just stay away? You're just riding up all the black folks! And they wanted to know the name of the black family and the place where we had stayed overnight. So we told them that we don't know. And uh, they said, why did you come? And we said, we, wanted, we came here to find out your side of the story, find out why there is this problem. Bullshit! So one guy picked up a huge wrench. Stop! Two policemen, state troopers, with these dark black Darth Vader type police masks. You white boys. You're gonna have to get out of here. You have no business here. You're gonna have to go now. But if we see you here again, we're gonna take you out in the countryside and cut off your balls and let you bleed to death. As harsh as that was, that was the nicest thing that was said to us in the garage because it meant we we're gonna live at least long enough perhaps to get out of the garage. I would be remiss if we didn't talk about the animation in the film. Yeah. The animation is a great storytelling device in the way that you've used it. And again, the way it's done harkened back to a certain a certain feeling, I guess. And the only way that I can best describe it is there's the scene where I think it's your uncle and another gentleman are going into the, this white building in Selma and they're accosted by a number of uh, a decidedly white crowd who are very unhappy um, with what they're doing in Selma, protecting voters' rights, or or even having dinner with the black families in town. And the way that animation plays out, it really was this, it reminded me sort of of this, I remember this sort of depiction of rednecks done by by an artist who did He's, I think he did Minutemen, he or she did Minutemen covers. There was a there was a Goo Goo Dolls album years ago called Jed that had this incredible animation that in the, the artwork was very similar. And I assume, I guess you must have gotten that again from what I'm kind of calling your sort of punk sensibilities, because that artwork was very much in line with with the depiction of rednecks back then by bands like Minutemen or Dead Kennedys or, you know, whoever. Right. Yeah. I think the artist you're referencing is uh, Raymond Pettibone. Yes, of course. Yeah. Who's uh, he's the brother of I don't know. I'm blanking, but the, the guitarist for Black Flag and got it. Okay. Owner of SST. So definitely that was a reference I sent. And I, and I got to obviously put his name out there. Uh, the animator I used, his name's Devin Enns, and mm. he's uh, he's an MFA student at Ohio State University right now. Okay. So. Yeah, that's something that we had talked about was, you know, making it kind of gnarly, like 
colorful but oh, like yeah. also kind of cartoony like an adult swim kind of look and totally and yeah that i um i made that choice because i just i get tired of watching documentaries that are all archival footage and i felt like right. for this we've all for the most part there's not a lot of new footage of selma and i used a, i used a little bit just for context but i didn't want it to be just narration over photographs and and archival video so yeah you know from the very beginning when I started this project, I was like, I'm going to, instead of doing that, we're going to animate. And then the other, you know, purpose that the animation served was that, you know, when my uncle went down, they didn't have cameras or video cameras. So there's really yeah. no photos or anything of them there to reference. We did, you know, pour through some of the FBI's archives and we couldn't really find anything that we were sure was them. Got it. So that it also served that purpose to connect, you know, their story and, and animate it. And that's something that, I think from day one that I had had Devin in mind, I was like, all right, when I do this, we're going to animate with him and, and really kind of make it tough and gritty. And I know it's kind of funny because like for my uncle, he was a little bit uncomfortable at first with how um, the portrayal and for me, oh, you know, the, wow, I'll bet. Of course, you know, kind of through his filter and through his lens, he experienced this, right? I, I hadn't even hadn't even occurred to me. Yeah. Tell me, how did he feel watching the depiction via animation? Well, he was great because he, you know, from the very beginning was tr and tr trusted me to tell this story and to tell it, you know, through my lens and the, the way that I wanted to tell it. But, yeah. um, you know, I think he thought at first he's like, well, that's you know, that might be there might be Southerners that take offense to these animations. <laughs> sure. But I guess for me. Like, I feel that these animations, they're not, you know, they're, they're comical, but at the same time, like when you pour through pictures of the clan from 1960 to 67, they're really not that far off. And I also think that these depictions, they're, they're an animation of, you know, the human inside and the hate and the, and the anger. They're not, and, and I think that needs to come through if you're going to visually animate something. And that's kind of the point. I don't think anybody would watch it and feel like, oh, these are drawn off of characters. Like they're, they are very cartoony. Yeah. And they're, you know, they're almost surreal in a way. But to me, the the animations express more than just, you know, a historical snapshot. They they express the the anger and the and the resentment of of these white people in Selma for for having, you know, northern whites come down and and, and march alongside the African Americans. And and again, I I want to say to you that animation. I'm I, I'm 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 warming up to it these days as a device for storytelling, but I'm generally not thrilled about animation. And I thought it was great. I loved it. It was a great way to to yeah fill in those gaps, and it was a great way to tell the story. Um, and it was also inspiring for me because you know we're we're in the midst of a of our documentary feature Elvis of Cambodia, and we're dealing with. Um, a subject matter that, you know, in particular, our subject, there is little to no uh, foot archival footage or photographs of, of Sinsi Samut, our Elvis of Cambodia, if you will. And so we are having to get very creative in the way that we're telling that we're telling the story that we're telling and animation is something that we're going to be employing. And I'll be honest, if you would have asked me if I'd ever have animation in any of my doc films in the past decade, I would have said, absolutely not. <laughs> Great. <laughs> but well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm excited at the possibilities. Actually, it's something new and I needed to open my mind and heart to it. And seeing films like yours really kind of helps me get there. Yeah. Well, and I think that that's for me kind of, you know, not having a bunch of, you know, being being newer to film, you know, having been working, you know, with films for the last four or five years. Right. I I don't have like a lot of hard biases or opinions because I'm just, you know, kind of learning and excited to do it and kind of putting my personality in. But totally, you know, step back and go to music. And that I think that was part of my problem with the music is once, you know, I've been doing it for so long and, you know, I was like, oh, you can't have more than one guitar in a band and this and that. And <laughs> I think that it's been exciting for me to you know, I'm incredibly pretentious about music. Yeah. And then, it, so it's been nice for me to kind of take, you know, that creative side and segue into something else. And I feel like incredibly liberated because, you know, with music, you know, having done it so long, made so many connections, had, you know, had so many different opportunities, you kind of feel like locked into doing this one thing and being able to kind of go into film and kind of start a new career has allowed me to just kind of start from scratch and, and really just, make a film that, that I want to see. And that I think, you know, comes from my heart. And 
So I, I don't know. I think that's an, if there's a way that for people to just kind of hit the reset button, I think it's, it's helpful, but it might be impossible once you've been doing something long enough. Well, you mentioned new career. So I guess my question for you now, Brian, is, is filmmaking your path now a hundred percent or are you still, or is Riot House Records still a label that's happening today? Is it, and yeah. So yeah, yeah that's a good question. So I think what I'm planning to do, I'm kind of in the, in the process of kind of transitioning Riot House. So I think my goal is, is to always do an original soundtrack for my films and right. then release that on Riot House. So keep that music side. You know, I've been talking with a lot of artists I've worked with in the past, you know, about doing future projects together. So I'd love to continue releasing music, but I'd like to always kind of pair it with the films that I do on Riot House. So we'll always do like a vinyl release of the soundtrack, you know. Right digital release of the soundtrack. But I think I just, you know, I told myself that if I ever, you know, kind of lost a little bit of my spark and passion for something that it was time to switch gears. And I think that definitely happened over the last couple of years with music. And a lot of that has to do with the business. It's just brutal right now. Right. And I don't think, you know, and probably in a similar way that filmmakers don't necessarily need huge distribution deals and, you know, really, you know, working with big studios, you can do a lot of this on your own. And I think there's a lot of similarities with music to that, that the label right now isn't really that necessary to, to make music and, and to produce and release music. Well, I may be at some point, don't be surprised if, if, I, if I reach out to you at some point, um, because we are, we are looking to have a soundtrack released with our film. And okay. it's going to have a lot of Cincy Samut songs as well as other Cambodian rock. So... At some point, and part of that is, I, you know, I'm working with another gentleman and we want to be able to kind of do it through what would be our own label. So that's going to be a completely new and first endeavor. So don't be surprised if I'm banging on your door or giving you another Skype call at some point and saying, Brian, I need some help here. Or just give me some recommendations. I'd love to to pick your brain on how one goes about and does that. Yeah, for sure. I'd, I'd love to help you. And that kind of segues into just to touch on the soundtrack of this film. Yeah. Um, so the, the, that's my friend Casey Varak, who is the guitarist in a riot house band uh, called porcupine that's based in Wisconsin. So that was, this film was kind of like the first pairing of doing that where I have a riot house artist did all the, the entire soundtrack. That's and, great. Yeah. And I, I, that's something that I really like. I get, I don't really, I'm turned off when watching films, when there's a bunch of licensed, you know, <laughs> pop <laughs> music, like, oh, yeah. you know, and I, so I know a lot of people love that and it's important maybe to have one or two of those spots, but I really love an original soundtrack. Me and so too. I think that's where I'm bringing, you know, my music background to film saying, no, like every film I do is going to have an original soundtrack that, you know, that, that makes the film unique and, and adds to that. So it only makes sense that you would be doing that. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger traveling through this world of woe. No when I first started making documentary films, I was often making them entirely on my own dime. It wasn't that it was a conscious decision on my part, I just really wanted to get out and start making my film. Does this sound familiar to you? When you have a great idea for a doc and the opportunity to get out there and start shooting, you don't want to let something like money get in the way of that. And for a while, it may not. But unfortunately, unless you have unlimited resources, eventually it will. Not having money for your doc film will slow you down, reduce your crew size, your film production values and aesthetics, even the story you're able to tell. And that's not even accounting for the additional stress, frustration, and your inability to work on the project full time. We don't accept that for ourselves anymore, and we don't want you to accept it either. Money is out there for every documentary film, and that includes yours. Every day, money is donated or awarded to documentary films. Why not yours? The trick is in knowing where to look for it and how to secure it for your film. In the Documentary Academy, we have the most comprehensive funding module that you will find anywhere in any course on fundraising for your documentary film. We cover the A to Z on raising funds for your film so you will never again be left wondering where the money's coming from. Enroll in the Academy today by going to the documentarylife.com slash academy and start your journey to raising ten, twenty-five, or even one hundred thousand dollars for your documentary film. 
So your film is showing now in the, over the next week or two, or actually, why don't you tell us what the release dates are? I know there's a, the theatrical release has happened already, and you've got some San Diego dates lined up, as well as a November, I think, 4th date for here in Portland, Oregon. And then you have a video on demand release date. Why don't you let my audience know about that and, and obviously how they can go and see your film? Right. So actually tonight uh, is the premiere in San Diego. Okay. And then it will be screening for uh, seven seven times after that. Right. And that's at a, a really neat little theater in North Park, San Diego called Digital Gym Cinema. And I'm really excited about doing it there because they're also a media arts center. So they're, they're a not-for-profit that does uh, filmmaking classes for area youth. And then they also have, you know, you can join, you know, be an adult member and, and get discounts on equipment rental and stuff. So that will be through the next week. And then the last screening will be November 4th at, in Portland, Oregon at the Hollywood Theater. Yeah, which is a great theater. In fact, Hollywood is our fiscal sponsorship for Elvis of Cambodia, the, the Hollywood Theater Organization. Cool. Uh, and it's it, it, have you been up here before? Have you been to the theater? I, have you been to Portland? I have not. Um, our... Records Collecting Dust, the last film I did, uh, screened there, and I think it was a pretty good screening. But no, I haven't. I have not been up to Portland yet. I need yeah. to need to put that on my my bucket list. Are for you next coming year. up here for that screening or not? No, I'm not. Okay. It's just just the film screening one time. Got it. Okay, got it. And then oh, then going into video on demand. Uh, yeah. After that, on October 25th, it's available on iTunes, uh, Amazon, and then Vimeo and a number of other uh, digital video on demand platforms. Excellent. Excellent. Of course, anybody can go to your website, answeringthecallselma.com. And speaking of Selma, I have to know, do you have plans to screen this in Selma? You know, I I had tried a little bit. And one of the things I ran into with this was that I I started filming in February this year and then had to finish by about September 1st. So it didn't Mm. leave me a lot of I, I think that's the one my one disappointment with this is that I didn't have a lot of time to schedule screenings and so I, I had made the decision that I wanted to put this out before election time on video right. on demand. So I got a, I was actually, I have a distribution deal with the orchard. So I got yeah. that. And then Great. I just, I kind of sacrificed a long series of screenings to have it out by election. So I love it. I love the choice. Yeah. It, yeah we'll see how it works out. I mean, you know, yeah. obviously there's that it's, it feels a little bit anticlimactic in some ways, but at the same time, like I'm, I think that a lot of my market is, is education and I think video on demand, but cool. if I could do one thing over, it would have been to buy myself an extra year to do some more film festival stuff and screenings, but next film, man. Right. <laughs> it's funny. Cause that both the films I've done, I've kind of come at it with already negotiating a distribution deal, having that all lined up and sort of done it all ourselves. So in a way, I guess I've been anti-establishment and not participated a whole lot in festivals. Um, Records Collecting Dust, I think, played at three or four <laughs> festivals. But, you know, I, I kind of came at it, you know, initially I was like, well, what are these festivals for? And I have an uncle that teaches uh, film at American University. He's like, well, it's to get a distribution deal. I was like, well, I already have right. a distribution deal. So, but um, no, I would love for my next film to to kind of maybe relax a little bit and and screen it you know, and, and get it in some festivals and travel with it a little bit. But these first two though, have been sort of a tight deadline. We're going to get it done and then we're going to put it out and it's, it's, it's worked so far, but it definitely seems in the to, future. Yeah. It seems to be working for you, man. One of the things that, that struck me after watching this film was I really feel after watching this film, I now feel more than ever an obligation to get out there and vote because I feel like I don't have one. I don't have an excuse not to vote, but two, the biggest thing is because of what has transpired before me, what people have done in order to make this possible for a great number of people. I guess what I'm going to ask you is what do you say then to someone? And maybe you're talking directly to me who is hesitant to vote because, man, they do not feel at all in alignment with either of the people that are currently running for president of the United States. I feel like if you if you are really feeling like you don't want to vote because of the two candidates, I think to me right. that's almost like the definition of white privilege because I feel like we don't oh, wow. even I have heard that. Well, I and, and I know that's a strong point, but I think that democracy it's to me it's crazy and a little bit selfish to think that every election you're going to vote in you're going to have one candidate that just represents everything for you sure like i think there are people living today that have lost loved ones you know just for registering 
people to vote in the 60s. And Correct. an example I'll give is uh, David Goodman, who is the brother of Andrew Goodman, who was murdered in 1963 in Mississippi. Right. And so I think that we have to think about it from that standpoint, too, that, you know, there are people that are living today that don't have a loved one with them today because, you know, they've sacrificed, you know, that loved one sacrificed their life for the right to vote. So I would, you know, ask people to to think about that, too. And I think as much as you have the right to vote, I guess you have the right to not vote as well. But I would just ask people to look, you know, really hard at this election, because I do think, you know, in terms of the two candidates, I think that, you know, there's one that doesn't that absolutely doesn't represent anything I stand for. And I think for most people, that's the case as well. I just think that Hillary Clinton doesn't have a great reputation. And there's a lot of questionable things about her that that I totally respect and understand right. people having trouble with. Right. And, 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 and I appreciate the personal candor with, with which you speak. I felt like just because of the timing of your film coming out and with the election, you know, a couple of weeks away, I, I, I had to ask, I had to ask what your yeah. feelings were on, yeah, on people voting or choosing not to vote. So thank you for that. Uh, again, thank you for being open and, and speaking with candor. I guess sort of a final question that I'd like to ask, and it's something that I generally, you know, I'll talk about on the podcast. In particular, I'll mention this with doc industry guests, is this idea of a documentary life. And the documentary life that I'm referring to is really this idea of, of how people how people make their livings while they make their documentaries or while they pursue their passions of documentary films. And it seems like you're at a point in your life where you've made it, you're making a transition from, from the record label to now being a documentary filmmaker. So I guess I would ask you, Brian, how is it that you, you feel that you lead a documentary life? Well, I guess maybe the first part would be that, um, like this is my life. Like I, I don't have like a big personal life outside of working on these projects and making films. Like this is really, I live, you know, for my family and then to be able to make films. Yeah. So, you know, obviously at this point in time, you know, the filmmaking isn't, you know, supplementing all my income. Um, I do a lot of freelance work here in the San Diego area. I do a lot of graphic design, web design work. And then I still, you know, have a lot of rec- I still have a lot of records that are being distributed under my label that that also add additional income. But I think, you know, my goal going forward, and I've talked to a few people about this, is that I think the opportunity to, you know, eventually be self-sustaining off of making documentaries is to not sell the films and to retain all rights and just sign distribution deals. So what I, you know, I foresee in the future is, you know, having five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten films that I own am distributing. And I think that that is, you know, a sustainable goal for filmmakers. You know, I have a lot of friends that have, you know, sold off films and really made pennies and the, the film's gone on to do very well. Oh yeah. But, you know, I guess you have to ask yourself, you know, at what point that's not even, um, you know, that's not sustainable. So if you want to make films, you know, maybe there's that sacrifice of not getting all the marketing dollars, not all the PR dollars, but doing it responsibly to where you build up a nice little catalog. And, you know, even if your film's doing a modest, you know, $10,000 a year in revenue, if you've got six or seven of those going, it will really allow you to keep keep making these films. And obviously, you know, that's the goal for everyone is to get the, you know, the $1 million deal up front. But, you know, that's realistically, that's not going to happen. And good luck as a documentary film. Yeah. Well, and I think it's for anything creative. I think we're sold. I think there's a lot. I think that it's kind of, it's like anything with the American dream. Like, you know, yeah, hard work, it does pay off, but you know, very few people are going to make a living in anything create, you know, it's just not, it's just a lot of it is luck. And a lot of it is the right person seeing something at the right time. And I think that you have to do, and I tell this to all the the bands on my label and, and a lot of people just can't get this through their head is that you have to do this because you love it and there's nothing else you want to do with your life. <laughs> and I think there's a great quote from Josh Homme of Queens of the Stone Age. Um, I think it's, it's along the lines of, you know, if you expect anything out of your art, expect to be disappointed. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's the way it is. And I think that once you grapple with that and then, you know, you can pair that with smart business decisions, but I just think that what really motivates me is wanting to tell stories, wanting to be creative. Like there's nothing like I'm not good at anything else in the world. I've held other jobs. I'm not good at them. Like this is this is what, you know, I feel like I'm meant to do. And that's what I would tell anybody else out there is, you know, find a way to make it sustainable and work. And I think you should only be doing it because you love it, because expecting anything else, I think you're going to be very disappointed. 
Brian, what a great conversation, man. I really appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to seeing more of your films. Again, let us know how we can see Answering the Call one more time, if you could. Yeah, so you can see Answering the Call. Probably the best best thing to do is just go to the website, www.answeringthecallselma.com. And it'll be available from there on uh, iTunes, uh, Amazon. And then if you're a college student or professor or, or faculty member, um, it's on Canopy as well. So canopystreaming.com. Brian, thanks for listening to the show. Thanks for being a doc life for yourself. And thanks for being on today's show. Really excited to see where this, uh, where, where your career goes, man. Hey, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. You bet. Don't forget, we'd love to have you join us in the Documentary Academy. Come and take a look at how we can help you make your best documentary film at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. That's thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.